Welcome back to Choice Classic Radio. In rounding out the changeup this week, we'll end this weekend with three episodes of Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb. We hope you enjoy. Yeah, I'm Johnny Madero, Pier 23. You know, it doesn't pay to buy a fast car in San Francisco because most of the time you got to be in low gear. The town is laid out like the profile of a chorus line, and the only time it flattens out is where it runs into the bay. The waterfront goes from south of the ferry building out past the China docks, and on a clear day you can see them batting baseballs over on Alcatraz. Pier 23 is over toward the left field sign, and not far from there you'll find Johnny Madero's boat shop. My place. Oh, I rent boats, and I do anything else that means long odds and short hours. It's a way to make a living. And if you never save enough to get married, at least you got enough to leave town. Maybe I should have left town Monday afternoon. I bought a paper, and I read about a build-up on a heavyweight fight in L.A. I stopped in at Lofty's, and the boys said neither one of those fighters could beat an egg with a power drill. About three o'clock, I started down Post Street when I spotted a new auction house. It was small, with enough dough-changing hands to buy back Manhattan Island. Inside it was packed, and up on a wooden stand, a bald-headed guy was selling everything but his suspenders. So I sat down in back, and I noticed a girl standing up against the wall. She was wearing dark green sunglasses, but the rest of her was just about as secret as a plow on the bathroom floor. Her hair was the color of half-past midnight, and her dress was made of the kind of goods you buy from spiders. After a while, she walked over to me. Right away, she started to get nervous, and when you look like her, you got a right to be. Mind if I sit down? They're your legs, lady. If you want to rest them, rest them. Thanks. You seem to like the view. Just temporary. I'm leaving. Will you get excited if I ask you to stay? Are you going to be proud if I do? Please. I want you to do me a favor. It won't take long. It'll be a small one. How small? They're going to auction off a black leather suitcase in a few minutes. It belongs to me. I must have it back. Can you speak the language? Do your own bidding. I don't want someone to know I'm here. It's important. I'll pay you $50 to bid for me. You just hired me. Just start bidding and keep on bidding till you get that suitcase. I want it at any price. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's a special item of interest. A black leather suitcase arrived yesterday. Contents unknown. It's handsome. It's beautiful. It's never been opened. Now, who's got sporting blood? The leather alone is worth at least 25 bucks. And it's heavy. It's heavy. It could be full of bricks and it could be full of gold. That's what makes it interesting. Now, who's going to start the bidding? Who's going to start it off with a big one? Two bucks. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. That's an insult. Two dollars? Who'll give fifteen? Ten bucks. Ten. Who'll give thirty? Ten. Who'll give thirty? Start pitching for our team, mister. Twenty-five bucks. Fifty. Fifty. Double it. A hundred. A hundred. The man in the gallery bids a hundred. You heard him, folks? One hundred. Who'll give two? Two hundred. Two hundred. You've got competition, lady. I got you. Keep doubling. Four hundred. Four hundred. That man in the gallery's got second vision. He knows what the suitcase is worth. The big four hundred. Who'll give eight hundred? Four. Who'll give eight? Eight hundred. Eight hundred. The man in front here says eight. Who'll give a thousand? The big eight hundred. Who'll give a thousand? Go ahead. Surprise the man. The OPA won't like this. You're working for me now. Make it a thousand. A thousand. A thousand. The man in back bids a thousand dollars. Who'll give fifteen hundred? A thousand. Who'll give fifteen hundred? All right. A thousand once. A thousand twice. A thousand for the third and last time. Oh, through bidding. So to the men in the gallery. Please come up and claim this prize now. Here's the money. Pick it up and come back. I'll be waiting. Yeah. And don't let him open it. Whatever you do, don't let him open it. It's your party, lady. I won't even let him peek. Ah, there's the lucky man coming down the aisle now. Give him room. Give him room. Ah, here he is. And here's your suitcase, mister. Want to open it and uh, tell the folks what's inside? Yeah, what's in it, man? Just one of my relatives. Here's a dope. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. All right. Now well, we have another item here. Oh. Oh, 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 sorry, son. I was just going for the empty seat. Yeah, we'll wait for your blockers next time, Pop. Where's the girl, the brunette with the dark glasses? Uh, it's a jail term, son. I don't follow him home anymore. Well, she was here a minute ago. You must have seen her leave. No. Think about it. She must have walked right past you. Think about it. No, son. When you get to be my age, you don't even do that. <laughs> I felt kind of silly, the same way you do when you find a hole in your sock at the shoe store. But it wasn't my dough that bought that case, so I couldn't beef much. 
When I got back to the office, I started working on the lock with the key. The case was made of plain black leather that was kicked around more than Minnie's gong. Then I opened it. A shiny-looking saxophone was laid out in three parts. For a thousand bucks, you can buy a whole brass section. So I went through each piece looking for a reason. There was a paper box inside the case. It had a gross of reeds in it. Same kind you find on the mouthpiece of any saxophone. I couldn't do much more, so I wrapped up the case and put it up in my closet. Then the door opened, and the trouble had a face. This was the way it looked in the morning. He stood there in the middle of the room, and his eyes held me like a fly at the end of two needles. He noticed his eyebrows. They were bushy and thick, and if they got any worse, he'd have to hire a native guide. Hello, are you Modelo? That's my story. You got a better one? It's sadder than yours. I'm the guy you left behind at the auction. Who are you bidding for? Who are you asking for? Myself. I suppose we get real friendly. What's your name? Dunlap. Larry Dunlap. Now, introduce me to the girl who was coaching you. All right. She was a souped-up brunette with a disappearing act. Now, what does that prove? Unless you find her in a cemetery, no trust a woman. Especially Claire Underwood. Yeah. What do you want from me? I'll take that black leather suitcase you won at the auction. Look, I saved you some dough. Don't make a pig of yourself. Try to be nice. I will. I won't kick you when you're dead. dead. Where's that suitcase? You're making me nervous. So if you got an itch, see a doctor. What makes you so big? Vitamins. I know all about the sax. Madero, it belongs to me. Give it to me or I start looking. You better have a license. A sax isn't that important. It is to me. Maybe I want to start a hot shop. I'll hold out for your girlfriend. She owes me 50 bucks and I need the dough. I'll double anything she gives you. If you mean money, give me a hint. What, 100 bucks do? Yeah. The sax is in the closet on top here. Come on. Give me a hand. Give me a hand. hand. Oh, sure. You've got a hand, Madero. Now play it out. Some days you're not going to make out any better than an ice cube at a cocktail party. When Dunlap hit me, I folded up and my head got the size of a social worker's heart. Well, I started tossing around on the rug. It took me longer to stop than it took Haig to quit Jersey. I knew that sax was gone, so there was no point in getting up. I started dreaming about that day a Cleveland bellhop gave me a key to the wrong room. It was going all right, too, until somebody began shaking me. In that small room, I didn't have to look up to know who it was. Because Inspector Warcheck of San Francisco Homicide is the kind of guy you stand next to in a hurricane and wonder what happened to the ventilation. Making a wish, Madero? Yeah, here, so it didn't come true. What are you collecting? Alibis. What's yours for last night at 12 o'clock? That was in bed. You got a witness? No, you can't win them all. Yeah, that's the way a guy named Charlie Riser felt. So maybe it's an epidemic. So maybe you started it. Someone shot him dead. The guy was a musician. Try some of the neighbors. Huh? I'll try you first. You're reaching, Warchick. I never even heard of the guy. Oh, that's a handicap, Madero. Maybe you just heard of his instrument, huh? All right, let me guess. It was a sack. Hey, you're very bright. An auctioneer helped me trace it down to you. Now, what's the pitch? A wild one, Warchick. A dame forced me to do her a favor. Uh-huh. I bet you force easy. She paid me to bid for the sax and then took a potter after I won it. You got an active memory. Does it include a name? Yeah. Claire Underwood. Run it down and see what it gets you. Oh, now, stop threatening me, Madero. I think that sax is tied in with the murder. Now, where is it? You're a little late. A torpedo named Larry Dunlap just walked in and sapped me for it. Yeah? How hard did he sap you, Madero? Hmm? There's a pool of blood behind your desk, and it doesn't look like yours. How'd it get there? I don't know, war chick. Maybe somebody got lost and figured it was a blood bank. How do I know? Yeah. Maybe they thought it was a morgue, too. Left a body. Now, look around. Yeah, do that. Look under the rug, too. Maybe the guy was thin. All right, Madero. So far, you're in the clear. But if there's blood, there must be a body close by. It'll show. When it does, we'll turn it in for yours. I'll remember. Like you remember that thousand bucks? Huh? The auction house, Madero. The thousand bucks you gave the joint got homesick and left. I'm broke, Warchick. Yeah. You'll have to stand on your head to pin this on me. Maybe I will. Maybe you're right. I forgot about your head. Once Warchek sticks to you, you might as well try to pull a mustard plaster off a throw rug. He stood there for a minute, blinking at the light, and you could see big pebbles of sweat standing out on his forehead. He took a handkerchief out of his pocket, and when it came down, it was wet enough to wash all the windows in lower Manhattan. After a while, he walked out. I watched him out of the window and tried to figure how I got into this. It was like trying to trace back a conversation to see what word started it. There were lots of questions and not too much time. Why was a saxophone and a grocer reeds worth all that dough? And who left his blood on my rug as a deposit? The girl must have known what was in the case, but why did she leave it with me? Oh, I couldn't make it add up, so I looked up the only good guy I know. A waterfront priest named Father Leahy. He knows most of the bad boys around the piers, and he's heard enough sins to start an art colony. 
Around Lofty's, they got his name above the line. And that's a tough trick, because along the waterfront, an archangel couldn't get a cup of coffee without hucking a wing. I found him over at the Parish house having dinner. Hello, Johnny. You want some wine? No, thanks, Father. That's one of the good things about this job. You get wine with your meals. Yeah, I know. Except you've got to watch out. I knew a guy in the seminary liked to eat between meals. Yeah, yeah. But the bishop fixed him. He sent him to a rich parish, and the guy had to throw away half his sermons. I'm in trouble, Father. Did you buy elevator shoes, or is that a bump on your head? Somebody knocked me down when I wasn't looking. Did you get the license number? It just felt like a truck. I got hit with a club. That's why I want you to help me, Father. Johnny, you misinterpret my mission in life. You need a policeman. I'm only a priest. Besides, I'm eating. Look, Father, homicide wants to tack a murder on me. There goes my appetite. Who's dead? Anybody I could have helped? His name was Charlie Riser. He was a musician. If he's going in the right direction, he may get some work. How did you meet him? I didn't. I never heard of the guy. It was all a surprise to me. Sounds more like a shock. I got a bum shake from the start, Father. A gal with a big purse promised to pay me something if I'd bid for a black suitcase at an auction. What was the matter with her? Laryngitis? She was trying to keep somebody from noticing her. But she must have weakened in the final stretch. What do you mean? I won the bid with a thousand bucks. But when I came back, the gal was gone. And you were left holding the bag. What was in it? A saxophone and a grocer reeds. You could buy the whole outfit with a five-dollar down payment. What makes it worth a thousand? I don't know, Father. The sax belonged to Charlie Riser. A guy named Dunlap offered me 200 bucks for it. All that money for a saxophone, and they wouldn't allow me 40 bucks on that old organ. Dunlap slugged me when my back was turned and piled up a lead. Did the sax go for free? Somebody paid for it. When I woke up, there was a lot of blood on the floor. Yours? It was unclaimed. But I have an idea a body's going to turn up without it. You have nothing but murder on your mind, Johnny. Why don't you settle down with a good book? If Warcheck tags me, I'll have to borrow yours, Father. Right now, I need you to check on a few people for me. Sure, but I'll need a couple of names for them first. You know a lot of the combo boys, Father. Check up on Charlie Riser's friends, especially his women. And find out where Larry Dunlap fits in. Will you do it, Father? Yes, Johnny, I'll do it. But if I find out you're calling them wrong, I'll drop over to Warcheck's side. Thanks, Father. If you help me out of this, you're a good guy. You're an angel. But stop pushing me. I'm not that anxious yet. When I left Father Leahy, I ran over my leads. You could have counted them on one finger and you'd still have to cheat. The only guy worth looking up was the auctioneer on Eddy Street. Maybe that was all revenge. Why did he tell Warcheck that I took that thousand bucks back? Well, I figured I'd find out, so I grabbed a cab back to his store. When I got there, the joint was locked up, but a big neon sign blinked the name J.C. Cole. There was another light coming from the back, so I followed it down. Inside, Cole was working over his cash register tape. I didn't knock, and right away he started making funny noises in his throat. I noticed he was wearing a vest without a tie, and his sleeves were rolled up with big rubber bands. His elbows stuck out, and they were red and knotted up like a baby's face with cramps. And then he made his opening bid. It's a little late. Uh, What can I sell you, mister? A straight story. Huh? The one you told headquarters had too many frills. Hey, wait a minute. You're the same fellow who bought that suitcase. You got a good head, friend. How good is it on robbery? It was dark. I thought it was you, so I called the cops. You started fast, but you're fading in the stretch. A thousand bucks was gone. I figured you took your money back. That's an early mistake. It wasn't my dough. You sound like you're mad. Is that a gun in your pocket, huh? If it makes you talk about that suitcase, I'll say yes. I don't know what you mean. I said you were taking your chances. A ton of bricks, a ton of gold, remember? I gotta make a living, you know. You don't have to crowd them in. What gives a sax a thousand dollar price tag? Huh? I don't know, I tell you. I, I, I don't know what thing. Yeah, well, we'll go into politics later. I think you're lying. I, I, it, it was just another suitcase, an old leather suitcase with a sax inside. I, I just tell you, I, I don't know a thing. Yeah, keep it up, fella. You'll tell me everything that way. Now, how did you know there was a sax in that case if you never opened it? Well, I... Now, listen, mister, let's be friends. I got a little money. Let's be friends. Go on. I was just trying to get a little ahead. I got a wife and a kid, a big kid, so I switched saxophones. I took out the original sax with the reeds and put in an older one. What'd you do with the original? It was a pretty nice one, brand new, so so, so I sold it to someone, uh, reeds and all, for $200. You're slowing down. Who's someone, a relative? He's a friend named Bud, Bud, uh, Bud Overbeck. He plays tennis sax at the downbeat club. That, that original was something special, huh? Yeah, you should have held out for a thousand bucks on both ends. Now, listen, fella, Bud's a friend, a good friend on my wife's side. You won't hurt him, will you? I'll send you a pint if he believes. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I- I'll save it. I- 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 anything else, huh? Yeah. Stop stuttering. You'll give that kid of yours a complex. <laughs> When he opened the door, you could tell he wanted to shake me worse than a summer cold. I didn't like him any better, but he'd given me something solid to work on. 
So I got over to the club downbeat. It's a jazz seller that warms over King Oliver at six bits a throw. Five-piece combo was writing a chorus slow and easy, and you knew the only notes they ever read were on IOUs. There were a dozen or so jazz fans huddled around the bandstand, and if you looked real close at their faces, you saw something that looked like pain. I asked the bartender who Overbeck was, and he pointed out the blonde kid with a face made of warm putty playing a black saxophone. I walked backstage to a small dressing room where the boys grabbed their second wind with a short one. When I opened the door, Claire Underwood stood there holding her breath. Hello, Johnny. You look angry. Put away those daggers, hmm? I will, baby. I'll guess that you killed Riser for a saxophone. Guess again. Why should I kill anyone for a sax? Tell me why it's worth a grand, and I'll answer that one, too. All right, Johnny. I'm sentimental. Say, Charlie Riser was my boyfriend, and I wanted to keep his sax as a memory. Must have been quite a memory, baby. You didn't meet Charlie. But I did meet Larry Dunlap. He wanted the sax, too. Why? How would I know, Johnny? Maybe he was taking lessons. They weren't that kind. He has too good a lip. So have I. Only I use it differently. All right, stop puckering, sweetheart. I want some sense now. Please, Johnny. If you leave now, I'll give you double what I owe you from the auction. That's not enough. Look, baby, count up your bills and tell me what a murder rap is worth, huh? We'll haggle over it later, Johnny. Just meet me at the Ajax Hotel, and I promise you, you'll get a better figure. Yeah. You gonna add some interest? Come here, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm not running a service. I need some answers. Come on, come on. I want some action. Come on. Use your arms, Johnny. You got too big a mouth, baby. Somebody's gonna close it on you. Show me, Johnny. All right. The music stopped, Johnny. What do you care? We're not dancing. Johnny, please, you're, you're squeezing me too tight. Yeah, it's a bad habit. Now tell me about that sax. Listen to me, Johnny. I told you I've got to see Overbeck first. I'll tell you everything later. Yeah, after you talk Overbeck out of his sax, huh? Yes. Is it a deal? You're too anxious to sign. I'll talk to Overbeck myself. All right, Johnny. I'll help you get him here quicker. Yeah, what are you going to do? Scream, Johnny. Scream. Listen. Louder, baby. You'll really need it in a minute. Help! 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 Hey, what's the matter? What was she screaming about, mister? She couldn't catch me. This man's drunk. He was trying to snatch my purse. Is that true, mister? Call a cop and find out. Yeah, I will. No, no. Please, uh, don't bother. Just get him out. Uh, just throw him out, Mr. Overbeck. You heard the lady, mister? Do I get rough? Save your strength, Overbeck. You'll need it later. <laughs> Claire had a nice act if you didn't mind playing straight man to a vulture. She draped herself on Overbeck's arm and she looked as cool as a vacation in Maine. As I walked out, Overbeck was still showing his teeth, but it didn't matter because you got the idea he wasn't strong enough to fight off a sneeze. Well, there wasn't much I could do except wait for Claire to show, but it started to drizzle, so I figured my best bet was her hotel. In the lobby, a rose-colored carpet with a touch of yellow jaundice led to the desk. My clerk told me she hadn't come in yet, but for five bucks he could tell I was a friend. He gave me her key. I went upstairs, and when I opened Claire's door, I knew something was wrong. A lot of towels were thrown all over the floor, and everything was gone from the closet but the mothballs. Claire had skipped, and before I could walk out, Dunlap walked in. One hand was in his pocket, and the other had enough tape to wrap up a mummy. Can I come in, madame? You're old enough, Dunlap. Make up your own mind. I have. Where's Claire? You're early. I think she's still busy. Give me a magazine. I'll wait. It'll be a long one. I'm not hanging around. Oh, the fun is just beginning. Sit down. Sit down. I guess I am tired. Yeah, uh, this gun makes everybody drowsy. Now, what's your time with Claire? Nothing that's deep-rooted. Are you writing a column? Yeah, the obituary. And you're going to make the morning deadline. You're too cocky, Dunlap. Don't turn your back. I won't. Claire blew her chance. The best she could do was disarm. Yeah, you ruined my carpet. When they pass your cup around, I'll be generous. In the meantime, you're going to stick around until Claire brings that black saxophone. I hope she's got some food in the icebox. What do you mean? Well, if you're waiting for that sax, we're going to starve to death. Claire's not going to show. What makes you a prophet? A guy named Bud Overbeck. He had the sacks last, and Claire was working him over for it. I'll work you over for less. What are the rest of her plans? She was warm. Maybe she left smoke signal. All right. You're getting too stubborn. Put away the gun, Dunlap. You can only use one arm. I'll clean the bases with this index finger. Pick a spot to fall. Hey, don't clutter up the floor now, Dunlap. we got company. Hey, what's this? The wrong room? Claire said we'd be alone. We are. Just the three of us. Who's he, Madero? Huh? What are you talking about? Claire told me to come here. She told me to wait for her. Look, fella, save your lip for another chorus. Just tell me where she left you. I don't feel so good. She was at the downbeat club. She was helping me put my sacks away. I I just came up here to wait. We were going to be alone. All right, fella. I'm cutting down the crowd. You with Madero now? I'm leaving. Yeah, I, I'm going home, too. I feel sick. I'm going home. You'll never make it on your knees. What's the matter? 
I don't know. I, I guess I gave the new horn too big a ride tonight. I got a weak heart. Your eyes aren't too strong either. You're walking right into that closet. They told me not to play so hard. Maybe I played too hard. Help me, Fowler. You look familiar. I seen you somewhere, huh? You, you look fuzzy. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel sick. Someone must have slipped me something. I... I never... Oh, I... Like this before. I'm sick. Real sick. I'm... You'll never get any sicker, fella. Overbeck was dead even before he had a chance to see if Gabriel paid his boy's scale. He hit the floor and turned over on his back, and you figured he'd cross the River Jordan with a backstroke. I got a good look at him now. His face was all twisted up like bed sheets after a nightmare, and up near his hairline, a long, thin scar ran into his scalp. Well, I didn't know what killed Overbeck, but whatever it was, he didn't get two weeks' notice. I figured if homicide caught me here, I'd get my walking papers, too, right down to the last 20 feet. I started for the door, but Warchick opened it for me. He looked at the body and then over to me. You on a spree, Madero? If you're footing the bill, Warchick. The state will from now on. Now, tell me about the guy on the floor. He's dead. Must have had parents. What's his name? Bud Overbeck. He was a musician at the Downbeat Club. Yeah. Tell me some more. Roll him, Warchick. Maybe he's got a diary. Wallet. All right, Madero. How long you been here? Why? The wallet's empty. Well, that's too bad. Your girlfriend's going to have to get along in last week's presents. I trail a guy named Dunlap up to this apartment, and I find you and a dead body. Now, there's a tie any way you look at it. Mm-hmm. That is what happened. I don't know, Warchek. I didn't see the picture. I just tagged by for the end. Yeah. Must have been a sad one. I think he's poisoned. I don't like the look in his eyes. Get the girl who put it there. Well, just give me a hint. Huh? Overbeck was playing caveman with Claire Underwood before he came up here. What does that give him besides hair? Maybe a Mickey. When I left, she was warming up an argument for his saxophone. She got it? She didn't. Dunlap's losing man hours. He just walked out here, and I think she's on his list. Yeah. I'm beginning to get an idea now myself. Does it hurt? You and the Underwood girl are running some kind of a racket for that saxophone. She left you behind a front for her. You haven't seen her, Warchick. She doesn't need that kind of help. But you will when I get through checking. Still got a few calls to make, and I want the lab to work over the body. By then, I'll have enough to come back and hold you, Madero. You couldn't hold a lap dog with a suction pump. All right, big shot. I'll go a long way to get you for this. A long way. You got the drag, Warchick. Yeah. It's going to slow you down a little. Warchek wanted to mother the body until the coroner came, and when I left, he was squeezing himself into a chair. He fit tighter than a whale in a crib. Well, you could word it any way you like, but the big riddle was that saxophone. Claire had it, and Dunlap wanted it, and a couple of guys died for it. My only alibi was Dunlap, but you might as well ask Khan to hold still for Lewis. I buzzed back to the office, but there was no message from Father Leahy. So I stared out the window for a while, wondering how to bake a cake with a dynamite charge when the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Johnny. This is Father Leahy. What'd you find out, Father? It's not pleasant, Johnny. I'm down at the morgue. A lab report on Bud Oberbeck just came in. He died of poisoning, huh, Father? The bitter kind. Oberbeck's heart couldn't stand all that dope. Hmm? Coroner found a used saxophone reed in Overbeck's pocket. It was soaked in hop. So that's what made that saxophone so big. The grosser reeds. That's right, Johnny. Overbeck was absorbing the stuff while he played. Oh. He probably never knew what hit him. Well, what about Riser? How does he figure? Riser was making his pin money peddling dope to nightclubs. He was getting his shipments from Mexico. How did Claire and Dunlap figure? There were a couple of partners who wanted to ease out Riser and go into business for themselves. The idea must have gone to Claire's head. She's doing a solo now, and Dunlap thinks she has the sacks. Warcheck feels the same way about you, Johnny. He's out to tag you for everything. He's smarter than that. I don't know him that well. But it adds up in his book because he thinks you're leaving town. Hmm? Someone's booked a passage on the 2 a.m. plane from Mexico this morning in the name of Jay Madero. I'm being jockeyed, Father. It's either Claire or Dunlap. They're both as black as sin. Maybe so, but Warcheck still thinks you're the dark horse. <laughs> Up until now, it was like trying to sell a toupee to a ball-headed eagle. But when the turn comes, everything happens in a hurry, and you began breaking more records than a disc jockey with a hangover. If Father Leahy was right, Clara Dunlap had enough dreams in that saxophone to start a waltz contest, and I knew if they both got out of town, Warcheck would be around to tag me for the last dance. So I got out to Mills Field, and out on the far end of the strip, a twin-engine plane was warming up. Clara was standing with her back toward me, and even from here, you could see what a stiff tailwind could do to a landing gear. 
When she saw me, she raised her eyebrows and figured her temperature was even higher. Sorry I had to borrow your name, Johnny. You're too small for it, baby. I got a big ego. And that gun bolsters it, huh? That's my story. Well, tell it to Homicide. They'll take a nibble on either you or Dunlap. Better throw him Dunlap. I got a date in Mexico City. It's a blind one, baby. You're going in the wrong direction. Larry, what are you doing here? I thought you... I want those reeds, baby. You'll be peddling pencils when I'm through with you. I'll leave the sides too, baby. I'll be lonely. You won't need that kind of music where you're going, Larry. You're the ones that talk, baby. I trusted you. We were going to do this together. I trusted you. We all make mistakes. You got the short end. I'll stretch it a little. You got another chance. Let's team up again. Sorry, Larry. I'm crowding you out. You only think so. Now get out of my way. I got to make the plane. Make a grave first. I want that stuff. I won't miss again. Stay away, Larry. Put up a sign. Yeah. You missed again. Give me the gun. No, I'm selfish. I'll hold on. Pull him off me, Madeira. Pull him off. There's a lot. All right, baby. You you run out of chances. It's my turn now. No. Please, Larry. Put the gun away. You win. I'll split it with you now. You win. Honest, Larry, you win. Just to show you I agree. You're through, guy. Drop the gun. Yeah. Well, what are the odds of my getting away in that plane? 70, 30, maybe. Uh, things are too tough at 50, 50. Come on, I'll ride downtown with you. Dunlap told the whole story down at headquarters. It seems that Riser, Claire, and he were buying dope from Mexico and peddling it here in the form of soaked up reeds. Riser was contact man in Mexico, but the only way they knew him down there was by his black saxophone. Claire and Dunlap decided to narrow the profits down to two by shooting Riser and taking over. Claire used the gun and, well, that started her to thinking that she could do even better with a single act. She needed that black sax, though. Riser got wind of it and hid the sacks with the reeds in the basement. His landlady found it after he was tumbled and sold it to that auction house. And Claire had me buy it and followed me back to the office where she tried to peg down Dunlap. The sack she took turned out to be a phony because the auctioneer had already sold the black one to Bud Overbeck. The track was switched to him, but not soon enough. Overbeck didn't know the reeds were loaded, and after an all-night jam session, he folded up with a heart attack. Well, Warcheck asked only one question. Wasn't it tough luck for an innocent guy like Overbeck? I don't know. At least there was one time he played right out of this world. Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb as Johnny Madero, has been presented by the Mutual Network. Johnny Madero is written by Herb Margulis and Lou Morheim. Gail Gordon played Father Light Leahy, and Bill Conrad played Inspector Warcheck of Homicide. Others in the cast were Helene Burke, Bob Holton, Herb Butterfield, Irvin Lee, and Herb Rollinson. Original music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the entire production was directed by Nat Wolf. We invite you to listen again next week over most of these stations when Mutual presents another adventure in the life of Johnny Madero, Pier 23. Tony Lafrano speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.